Well, here we go. Welcome to the Joe Secor Show live on Facebook. So nice to have you along. Another exciting edition. <laughs> Do you ever have those experiences where you're like running late and you're kind of nervous, whether it's to a dinner party or a date or to the movie or to mass? No, I know you're never late to mass, right? Anyway, and you kind of get up tight and it's like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm running late. I had that feeling. No, right now, tonight. I'm like, going, I'm running late to my own show. But here we are. We are all together. And it's so nice to have you along. Uh, if you've been listening <coughs> to our shows here recently, you know I've been talking about Christmas things, like gifts that you can give yourself. But I want to change gears tonight and talk about something that if you're not <coughs> dealing with specifically, you probably know somebody who is dealing with this and is profoundly punctuated during holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas. And what I'm talking about is loneliness. And as exciting as Christmas is for me and the holidays, I, I love it. I'm, I'm not lonely. I'm very grateful for that. I've got wonderful people around me and, and I feel that love and I feel loved and I love and all these things contribute to feeling, hey, how are you? Good to see you. Uh, all these things contribute to you feeling really good, but there's some facts about loneliness that I think are really important to talk about. Because again, even if you're not lonely this holiday season, I guarantee you, you know somebody who is. Now, I'm not talking about the obvious lonely person that you might think the widow or the person who is all alone in the retirement home. I mean, maybe that person who is married, maybe who has kids, maybe who has friends, but they still feel really lonely. And there's some facts that you should know about loneliness and how it attacks the body. Usually if you go to your doctor or you talk to people about health, they talk about physical fitness and exercise and eating right and sleeping and everything else. But there's something even perhaps more profound that has a more profound impact on your physical well-being, believe it or not, and that's your sense of loneliness. There is a connection between the brain and the body. And when things aren't going right here or in here, if you might experience your emotions as being on your heart, it has a profound effect on the body. Now, the first thing that I want to say is that 40% of us, you, me, all of us, how are you, Joe? Uh, about 40% of us will experience loneliness at some point during our life. And there could be a lot of reasons why you might be feeling lonely. And it doesn't have to do with the number of friends that you have. You could have a lot of friends, you could be married, you could have kids. You could still feel lonely because the sense of loneliness depends on the subjective quality of your relationships. So in other words, it's not the objective. You can't count and say, well, I have, I have eight friends and four brothers and I've got a wife and I've got a dog. You could still feel lonely if subjectively you feel that there's not a significant connection with those relationships. And I, I want to talk about it. I, I don't think there's a lot of conversation about the feeling of loneliness, but it has such a profound effect, again, on our body. So I want to invite you, as I do on every show, this is a live show, if you have a question about loneliness, if you're feeling lonely, if somebody around you is lonely, you don't know what to do, you're feeling depressed, especially now, I want you to reach out, type your question, if I can respond to it. Uh, in real time, I will do that. Remember, this isn't a private forum, so everybody can see your question, but trust me, if you're asking the question, it's probably worth talking about. So the question is this, if you're feeling lonely, I would say that you probably don't feel connected, right? So what happens when we don't feel connected? Well, let me just put out some statistics here. 60% of the people who report feeling lonely are married. 60% of the people who feel lonely are married. So again, it's not just about surrounding yourself with people, but if you don't have that connection. Now, here's the problem among many problems with loneliness is when you feel lonely, it actually obscures your perception of relationships. So if you are lonely, you might look, you might actually have people there who love you, who want to connect with you. But if you feel lonely, you're not going to recognize the value of that. Dorothy, let me check out your question here. 
What about the guy that feels so lonely even around others and just wants his life to end? Your oldest son. Oh gosh, I am so sorry to hear that, Dorothy. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk about this and maybe when this show is all done, you can actually um, have him tune into the show, even if it's done later on, because we, we post them up on the, uh, the Facebook page. And you can see, because I'm going to talk about some things that your son can do. Your son is probably struggling with depression. I'm guessing uh, loneliness is different than depression, but loneliness can lead to depression. Because if you don't feel valued, if you don't feel cherished, if you don't feel connected with other people, it leads to hopelessness. And that, not to scare you, Dorothy, but when we feel hopeless, when we don't feel that there are any answers, it can actually cause people to feel suicidal or suicidal ideation at least, which just means I don't want to go on with my life. I'm not saying that your son is going to commit suicide or anything like that, but I'm going to talk about some very real things that you can do, Dorothy, um, to alleviate it. He's in, uh, but he's in jail right now. Okay. He's not married, but he's in jail right now. Well, he, that is brutal, you know, and, uh, I get it. Jail is a very, very oppressive place. Trust me. When I was a police officer and I would bring, um, you know, those who were arrested to, you know, LA County jail, I walked out of there and I, I just felt like, oh my gosh, <laughs> How, how do I cleanse this from me? You know, because it's so oppressive. Uh, but there is hope. I, I know many people who have been in jail and in prison and have actually come out of it and found new meaning and purpose in life. So there's really hope for not only your son, Dorothy, but for others. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about some of the things perhaps that your son can do. And maybe you can write him a letter and give him some of these um, very... Uh, doable interventions. He can actually do things himself, even though he's feeling, I'm sure, isolated and he's feeling bad about himself. Uh, but I want to talk about how devastating it is. But again, the first thing is that we recognize that loneliness is contagious. So what does that actually mean? Well, when you see somebody who is lonely, <laughs> you are going to be drawn down in a sense with them. Now, again, our faith is really about entering into the lives of other people, particularly when they're struggling, when they're suffering. So to visit the imprisoned, to visit the elderly, to visit the widows, to the orphans, you know, very, very clearly our gospel is about entering into the suffering of other people. But I want you to know that, uh, I, I want you to know that He's not coming out for three cases of murder against him. Wow, Dorothy, that's significant. Again, I, I want you to write him a letter. I don't know if he has access to the internet because maybe he can check out this show, but I'm going to give you some sound advice perhaps that you can carry, um, bring to him. But, and listen, we know that God can't be kept out of any bars, right? We know that God's Holy Spirit cannot be contained so wherever he is, even if he's incarcerated and it looks like it's a lifetime sentence, we know that does not stop God from entering into his life. When, when you have that relationship with God solid, you are no longer lonely. But I, I appreciate you reaching out and I'm, I promise you I will pray for your son. If you tell me his name or his first name, even I'll, I'll pray for him. I promise to do that. But when you feel lonely, you don't perceive life truthfully as it is, you have a tendency to devalue your relationships when you feel lonely. So you have to recognize that. If you recognize that in yourself, that you're not seeing life clearly, then you have to begin to challenge the thoughts and the feelings that you have, and you've got to act counterintuitively. And I'm going to be very specific about this, but I want to begin by talking about loneliness as contagious because there was a study done that looked at lonely people and those, let's say you reach out to those who are lonely. And what they found sadly is that after the six month study, they found that the lonely people were pushed out further into the periphery. And those who walked with the lonely were also marginalized or pushed out. So if you're trying to intervene in the lives of somebody who is lonely, recognize that you're going to pay a price. And I say that because if you recognize that there's a price you're going to pay, then you can actually take steps to alleviate the suffering that you might feel. 
Uh, Buford is his name. All right, I will pray for Buford. Um, I will pray for him. Um, so there is that study that showed that people who feel lonely are pushed further out. And if you understand that, you see this vicious cycle that people who are lonely feel. And that means that with even greater energy, with greater prayer, you've got to go in. You've got to care for yourself, though. If you are caring for or trying to intervene in the lives of those who are lonely, you've got to make sure that you take care of yourself. Jesus very clearly did this, right? He intervened in the lives of those who were lonely, those who were suffering, those who were struggling, those who were lost, those who were in need of healing. But he did that, and then he would go off to recover his own energy, his life, his faith, by connecting with prayer to God. So if you're doing that, but there was a study, I want to talk about loneliness for a second, because you've probably heard the expression being pushed out into the cold. You know, I feel cold and lonely. Believe it or not, there are studies that have shown that people who are feeling lonely, even if you're not lonely right now, and I asked you to consider, to think about, to meditate about a time that you felt lonely, you would perceive coldness on your body. You would estimate the temperature in the room to be lower than it actually is. And there are those who have actually even found that it made their skin temperature drop. Those who are lonely. So when you talk about it being a lonely, cold world, it's true. But loneliness doesn't only affect uh, our emotional state. Obviously, it's very difficult to feel lonely. It not only affects how we perceive the temperature in the room, but it actually has, it increases blood pressure, our cholesterol, it activates the stress response, uh, it increases our risk for cardiovascular disease, it suppresses the immune system. They even found one study found that uh, college, so here's another great example, even kids, freshmen who go to college and they frequently experience loneliness because they're in a new environment, they might not have their same cadre of friends, they found that when they got flu shots, it didn't have as much of an effect, a positive effect for them because of their loneliness. So some studies have actually shown that loneliness puts us at even greater risk than smoking cigarettes. So I want to continue to talk about some of the effects of loneliness because I want you to see that this isn't just something to be say, well, you know, go out and get a friend. It's really significant. So chronic loneliness actually increases early death by 14%. <laughs> so it's a real, real problem. So I want to talk about the tips. And Dorothy, here's where you can take notes or maybe um, you know go back later on and write this down because I want you to write a letter to your son. And I want him to know, Buford to know, that me, Joe Sikora, a former police officer, is praying for him while he's in prison because whatever he's done, right? Whatever he's done, and I want you to consider this, when Jesus was dying on the cross, right? He had two people on either side of him. And the one said, Lord, remember me this day when you enter into paradise. And he said, this day I will remember you and you will be with me in paradise. So there is always hope. And if there's anything that can help to alleviate loneliness, it's the sense of connection. Yes, with others, but with God. So remember that if you're feeling lonely right now as those who are dying on the cross next to Jesus, the one reached out and said, remember me. God remembers you. You are not alone. So I want to talk. I want to shift gears and talk about some very specific uh, things that you can do if you're feeling lonely or if somebody that you know is feeling lonely, uh, you can uh, help them. And yes, there is always hope, Joyce. Absolutely. So the first thing that I want to talk about, uh, and I was reminded of this when I was talking to a, a good friend of mine just the other day, and he's a great guy. He's a great athlete. He's very smart. He's getting older now, and he had a relationship that just went south on him, and he was just devastated. And he said, Joe, he says, I've just been, and he's a big, strong guy. He goes, I was just lying on the floor in tears. I couldn't stop the tears. And the loneliness, he's, he's really stuck there because he feels like everything that he loved, everything that he hoped for was gone. And he had this profound sense of loneliness. But as we continued our conversation, 
I asked him, well, what does this mean to you? I know you feel this dark, difficult feeling, but what do you actually believe about yourself in the midst of your, of, of your loneliness? And, and one of the things, and again, I'm just truncating, I'm giving you the abridged version of this conversation, and you don't know who he is, and I'm not betraying any confidence. He, he would want me to share what I'm sharing with you right now. But what he was saying is he believed all sorts of negative things about himself because of his loneliness. And when you're lonely, you're more inclined to give voice to that, that negative voice that speaks to all of us, right? We all have that inner critic. And we have God's spirit that lives us in us, that encourages us, that inspires us, that gives us energy. But we've also got that inner critic that might say, when you're lonely, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm unlovable, I'll never find love again. And you've really got to pay attention to that inner critic and say, enough, stop. Literally, stop, negative voice, stop, inner critic. You are not stronger than the spirit that lives inside of me. And so you've got to pay attention if you're lonely to the words that you're saying to yourself. Because these things that you say to yourself, for instance, I, I'm not lovable. If you say that enough, guess what? You're going to feel not only unlovable, but you're going to feel depressed. You're going to feel more isolated. You're going to be less inclined to actually get out to push yourself to try to engage in relationships. So you've got to be aware of the voice that's speaking to you, that negative voice. Remember this, one of the most well-known verses in all of scripture, John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world. And you can say, for God so loved you, the lonely you. He loves you so much that he came into the world to sacrifice his life so that you could live not only in heaven and eternity, that's for sure the big, big one, but right now, God died, God entered into the world so that he could die, be resurrected, so he could send a spirit so that you could have life right now. That message is for you. The second thing that Jesus speaks about this in, in Luke chapter six, and he talks about it, uh, your voice with other people. He says, look, don't criticize other people. Don't condemn them when they're down, right? Why? Because it leads those other people to feel lonely, to feel depressed. And I want to suggest, this isn't too far of a stretch, to say these very same words can be expressed or used on yourself. Don't condemn yourself when you're down. Watch how you're speaking about yourself. Don't jump on your faults and your failures. So you've really got to replace those negative thoughts, those negative beliefs with a more balanced uh, balanced belief, like I am lovable. Now again, you don't have to believe me. This is what God says about you. You are lovable. You're so lovable that I'm going to die for you so that you can live forever. So if you're feeling lonely, if you find yourself expressing all of these negative thoughts, replace them with a verse from a word from scripture, a verse from scripture, God's voice speaking to you that he has given you life. I, the, the second thing, uh, and Dorothy, obviously, you know, this is a challenge for your son. He's been removed from society, right? He's now in prison. Uh, he feels isolated, but God isn't distant. There are probably others there with whom he can come in contact who recognize that they've made terrible mistakes and yet they can move forward. So you want to really resist the urge to isolate. So whether this is you that you're feeling lonely or a friend of yours or a family member, uh, remember, uh, Lucy, I'm going to actually quote that verse right now. I'm going to talk about that. So you're ahead of me. That's good. I'm glad you're paying attention. Um, but remember, sometimes you've got to act counterintuitively. How many times if you work out, for instance, do you say, ah, I don't want to work out. Doesn't matter what you feel. Go do it anyway. Or you're tired in the morning. Ah, oh, I don't want to go to mass. Doesn't matter. Go do it anyway. Frequently, right, if you're in a relationship, you don't want to do those loving acts for your spouse or your children you don't have to act just based on how you feel. You have to act based upon what is right and good. And sometimes that means you have to act counterintuitively or in a different way. 
one of the chapters I quote frequently, you've probably heard me talk about this, is if you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling isolated, you're probably doing one of two things. You're probably blaming other people that they're not coming to your rescue or a part of your life, or maybe you were left or abandoned in a relationship, or you're blaming yourself. Remember that inner critic that's saying, you know, I'm no good, I'm not lovable. Well, again, go to John chapter nine and read it. I'm just gonna paraphrase it rather badly right now. But the blind man, right? And Jesus is there, the disciples are there. Who's to blame, Lord? They ask. Now, you're asking the wrong question, right? And who is to blame isn't going to help you alleviate your loneliness or it's not gonna help other people to alleviate their loneliness. Look instead for what God can do. That's what Jesus said. And then, of course, he healed the man. And God can heal you from your loneliness. You might not know how to get out of it. You might not know how to take those next steps forward. But trust, believe, recognize that God knows the way, even if you don't know the way. If you're feeling lonely, uh, maybe you're in a, you know, a dating relationship or maybe you've got some friends who are toxic or are always the constant pessimist bringing you down. Look, there might be a time to weed them out of your life. Now, if you're married, I'm not saying get divorced, right? I'm, I, what I would say is work on your marriage, right? Because if you're lonely, most marriage, most marriage therapists, and I agree with this, would say that marriages can be saved. You can move from that place of loneliness to a, a relationship that is connected and fulfilling. Remember, 60% of all the lonely people are married. So what do you need to do to actually connect with your spouse? Again, topic for a different night. But those relationships that you can weed out, maybe it's a sister or a brother or a friend or a boss or whoever it is that's constantly bringing you down Weed out those toxic relationships so that you can make room for the healthy ones. Think about this weeding, weeding the garden, which I do all the time. <laughs> I don't ever. I hate weeding. My wife loves it, and I'm glad she loves it because I hate weeding. I like mowing the lawn. But, you know, you've got to remove those weeds in your life so that that plant, that green, life-giving plant come, come forth and to go back to what you just said a moment ago, the scripture, you know, Matthew chapter 11. Are you tired? Are you weary? Get away with me. Are you lonely? Jesus calls you into relationship. Get away with me. Just today, I wasn't feeling particularly lonely, but I was too tired to work out. Not really too tired. I just thought, ah, my muscles ache. I don't need to work out anymore. And I thought, what do I need to do? So you know what I did? I picked up my Bible and I said, I'm gonna read Ephesians. It's just six chapters, right? So it's not like it's spend, you have to spend days, but I read the six chapters of Ephesians. And it, it's, it, I was thinking about getting away with God and I thought, okay, I just need to connect with God. And I felt so much more life after spending that time, after I just took in those words of God and scripture. And they were spoken very clearly to me. And, and I wanna say in Ephesians chapter one, and I'm just gonna paraphrase it again, but this is the message that long before God created the heavens and the earth, he had you in mind. He had his focus, his attention on you before he created anything else as the focus of his love. You find your purpose, your meaning in him. You find the alleviation of your suffering. You find the alleviation of your despair, of your loneliness with God. Now, again, when you nurture that relationship, what does God want you to do? He probably is wanting to push you out and then say, I want you to connect with others because there are other people out there who are lonely. There are other people who are suffering and struggling and I want you to connect with them. That's one of the things that I love particularly about our Catholic faith. And if you're not Catholic and join us, welcome. I love to, or if you don't even believe, welcome. Uh, this isn't a show just for Catholics. Uh, but the wonderful thing, one of the wonderful things that I think Catholic faith really pushes is the sense of community. Not only do you have a personal relationship with Christ, which is important, but we share that relationship. We worship, we praise, we come together, we go to Mass together as a community. It's one of the most psychologically healthy things that we can do because we're pushing to connect not only with God, which is the most important thing, but with one another. 
And when you feel that real strong connection, that's what actually helps to alleviate the loneliness. Now, another uh, thing I want to talk about, how are we doing on time? Ah, so much to say in so little time, is nurture, if you're feeling lonely, nurture your support network. Now you might say to me, well, Joe, if I had a strong support network, I wouldn't feel lonely. It's a good idea, but here's how I want to respond to it. You nurture your support network by giving. When you give, when you impact somebody else's life in a small way, that helps to alleviate the loneliness, because you're seeing that you have something to give. Never underestimate what you have to give, even if you're feeling lonely. It's always the small things. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, he said, whatever you do, the smallest act of giving, giving somebody a cup of cool water, makes you an apprentice that connects you not only with that person that you're serving, but it connects you with God because you're becoming God's disciple. You're doing what it is that he wants. Think about the woman. I love this story, right? I talk about it all the time. But if you're thinking you're lonely and you have nothing to give, who do we still talk about this day who gave pennies in scripture? The widow's might. The story of the widow had nothing. She gave a couple of pennies, literally, to the temple as an offering. That's who Jesus connected with. And he said, she gave more. So if you're feeling lonely, nurture your support network by giving. Never underestimate what it is that you have. Now again, nurturing your support network, I want you to also expand your social network. How can you do that? Go to mass, join a committee that's serving others, serve the poor. Again, expand your social network. Sometimes, again, and it's very, it's, it's common, I understand it, it's completely, completely understandable. If you're feeling lonely, what do you want to do intuitively? You want to crawl into your bed and cover your face and just hide. You've got to act counterintuitively. counterintuitively. You've got to take a chance. You've got to take a risk. You've got to be willing to share yourself. You've got to open up. One of the reasons why you might be lonely, and again, there could be a myriad reasons why you're lonely, but one of the reasons could be that you're closing down, that you're not willing to actually share yourself, your authentic self. Maybe you think you have nothing to give. Maybe you feel like you're unlovable, but you are lovable. Remember, God died for you, for me, for you, for you, for you. God died for everybody. So take that risk See how you can share of yourself. Luke chapter 19, risk your life and get more than you could ever dream of. If you're lonely, you've got to take that chance and say, oh, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to go out. I'm going to make the phone call. You know, again, this life that you have been given, as, as Paul says, and I love this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, why do you think I risk my neck doing this? And Paul took great risks preaching the gospel, Right. Paul had to fight off wild beasts. Paul was in prison. Paul was beat up. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was imprisoned, right? And Paul said, why do you think I do this? The answer is this. It comes down to three words. Resurrection, resurrection, resurrection. Really one word. <laughs> but resurrection, this life you have been given isn't an isolating, me-centered life. It's a resurrection life. And when you actually take that resurrection life in, when you're willing to take a chance and a risk and share it, you're going to get so much more than you thought you could. If you are lonely, or if you see somebody that's lonely, and again, I encourage you to share this page with them, like it and share it so they can look at this. But ask for what you need. Be direct. I know it's really difficult sometimes. If you're feeling lonely, the last thing that you want to do is to reach out and say, hey, I'm really suffering right now. I'm really struggling right now. I've been there. I've done that. But you know what? Thank God I acted counterintuitively and I said, you know what? This is what I need. I need a friend to hang out with right now. I need someone to listen to. I need someone to speak to me. I need somebody to listen to me. I need somebody to go out and play with. I need somebody just to be there, to pray with me, whatever it is. 
ask for what you need, be direct. Again, completely consistent with the gospel. Jesus says this, Matthew chapter seven, ask for what you need in prayer. Sorry, I didn't mean to yell at you for that, but ask for what you need because the God who conceived you in love wants to give you his very being. He doesn't want you to live in loneliness, especially during this Christmas season. Take action. You know, don't wait for an invitation. If you are lonely or if you know somebody who is lonely, don't wait for that invitation. It may or may not come, but you know that you can impact your life. You know that you can actually have a significant impact on your lonely feelings if you take it action. Invite people into your life. You might not want to, but this is what you've got to do. A true friendships are crucial and yet so rare. But Adam, I want to say, do your part. Find those people who want to share your faith. Find those people with whom you can share your life, your hopes, your dreams. They might be screaming out saying, oh, I've been waiting for somebody to have a deep and meaningful conversation. So Adam, you take that chance. Remember, connect. If you are feeling alone, aloneness is different than loneliness. But if you're alone too much, right? Like Dorothy, your son, in prison. But if you find yourself alone too much, one of the ways to alleviate or to prevent yourself from feeling lonely is to connect to the deeper you, your real values. Remember who lives, who breathes, who moves in you. God himself, God has given you his Holy Spirit. Connect with that life. Remember, loneliness is preventable and loneliness is curable. Take those steps, especially these days around the holiday season. It's a tough time for a lot of people because even if you feel joy, I'm telling you, there's a lot of people and they might be right under your roof or right in your community who are feeling lonely. Take that step and connect. Connection with others, connection with God, that's what will lead to your greatest happiness, your greatest joy in this time. I will meet you back on the road. And remember, always forward.